So if you've been following this news outlet recently, you know that Director of Special Projects Dylan Nolan and I recently took a trip to the U.S.-Mexican border, part of a multi-state delegation, including early voting states Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina. Now, on this trip, we heard from numerous experts covering multiple facets of this escalating crisis at the American southern border. Now, one of those briefings that we were able to listen to involved local law enforcement in Yuma County, the local politicians in Yuma, and the former head of the Yuma sector of the border. Now, we've published excerpts from this briefing previously, but we felt that this content was so important that we wanted to share the briefing in its entirety. Here it is. This way you understand that the different dynamic that we're dealing with. So fentanyl obviously is the big one now. So Texas, the first quarter of 2023, Texas seized about 1.5 million dosages of fentanyl and 33 kilograms. For New Mexico, 923,000 dosages or pills and only nine kilograms. Now keep in mind one kilogram is 2.2 pounds. So if you want to do the math on that, that's still quite a bit. California, they had 10.9 million seizures of pills and 627 kilograms of fentanyl. Arizona, 24.27 million pills this first quarter. 877 kilograms. So for the whole of the southwest border this first quarter, there was over 43.6 million dosages or pills of fentanyl and 1.5 or you know, 1,561 kilograms of just fentanyl. And we know throughout this country, over 100,000 people are dying each and every year now because of fentanyl. The scary part is that most law enforcement throughout the United States has had to adapt in regards to fentanyl by carrying Narcan so we can revive people and save their lives. So now your cartels are further exploiting this by adding, and I always crush this word, but xenophil. It's basically a drug that's used for equines, horses. And the problem is, once they lace fentanyl with this narcotic that's used on horses, Narcan no longer works. So we're not gonna be able to save lives anymore. And we've actually had to put out a press release, local law enforcement, the city of Yuma, as well as the county, to anybody that knows a family, a friend, anybody that doesn't fentanyl, that they might not be able to save that loved one's life now because of what's being laced into fentanyl. So that's just the fentanyl aspect of it. I can always go into the others, numbers, cocaine, meth, marijuana. Marijuana is still an import that's coming in. For Yuma County, I just wanted to cover, because the Sheriff's Office here, like most in the country, handle the medical examiner office. We do here in Arizona. So for overdoses last federal fis or fiscal year, 36 overdose deaths, 15 of those were from fentanyl alone. So far in 2023, we've had uh, six overdose deaths with four being linked straight to fentanyl. That's not a good thing, not for our county, not for our community. When we look at the impacts of the, the border issues, and that's you, you're starting your tour to get to that, so you heard 200,000 roughly full-time, another 100,000 on top of that for our culture winter visitors. Last federal fiscal year, the Border Patrol apprehended over 310,000 people coming across our river corridor. As I understand it, that's where you will be going. So you actually see where these crossings are happened. Every one of us here has been down on the border and picked up passports and IDs from a number of these individuals or they've dumped their IDs, they even dumped their money because A, they don't want to be caught because they know that they've already fled a country of violence and they're being allowed to live in another country and work. But they don't want that, they want to come here because it's free. 
that's the marketing strategy of the cartels. And I'm sure Chris can go into that a lot more. He's dealt with it from that angle. But the scary part is the getaways out in the eastern part of my county. I think it was 28,000 last federal fiscal year that got away from Border Patrol. We know they crossed. We've got pictures of them. But nobody was able to intercept those 28,000. So 310,000, I think it was around 140 different countries that we see here. Some of them are special interest countries with terrorist ties. And I'll let Chris kind of go into that too. But that's concerning for me as a public safety person. We've seen what happened on 9-11. And that was government sanctioned individuals being allowed to come in on a visa. These are, oh, is that my time limit? Yeah, yeah, you're <laughs> Sorry. So this year, I think we're already at 120 some odd thousand. This federal fiscal year, which starts in October, by the way. Our starts in July 1. So, and we've already had over 8,000 getaways. What country are they from? Where are they going? What's their intentions? That's a concern for us in public safety. Now, all these individuals that I mentioned coming up and crossing in and Border Patrol's apprehended, they're not staying in Yuma. They're going to the northeast of the United States and the northwest. They're not staying in Yuma County. So they're coming to a community near you. And I know the mayor will cover some of the uh, impacts that happen at our hospital. The, the budget will be covered by uh, Jonathan Lyons, but I'm here to answer more questions. I could stand here all day and cover all kinds of aspects of it. I've been called loquacious. So anyway, who's next? We're gonna let Chief Clem go next, but one of the things that I wanted to point out so that everybody understood is that we really work well, state, local, and federal here. And whenever we've had a particular challenge or a concern, uh, the sheriff is always accessible. And most importantly, in our uh, federal agencies, Chief Clem was always accessible to the mayor, myself, and to, uh, and to the sheriff so that we could resolve the challenges in real time. And I think that's one of those things that makes Yuma unique. Um, Chief didn't sugarcoat it. He told us exactly what was going on so that we could prepare as a community and work together so that we were uh, able to minimize the impact. Uh, Yuma is kind of a pass-through community. We don't have many people staying here, but uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Chief Chris Clem. And they, you've already been with them, right? I, I was sitting in the background um, over at the, uh, the Civic Center, or not the Civic Center, but the conference center. I'm going to speak from here because I made some, uh, some talking points. But real quick, um, my name is Chris Clem. I spent 27 and a half years as a U.S. Border Patrol agent. I retired on New Year's Eve just a few months ago. So uh, uh, I retired as the chief here in Yuma. I was the chief patrol agent uh, for uh, just over two years here. Prior to that, I was the deputy chief patrol agent in the El Paso sector. Um, and, and I spent uh, a majority of my career on the southwest border with a couple of uh, penalty stops in Washington, D.C. Well, no, actually <laughs> promotions and good opportunities in Washington, D.C., as well as a deputy chief uh, in, um, in New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, working some of our coastal challenges. But I, I wanted to make sure that everybody understood, uh, if, uh, and I didn't want to get too far along, but Jonathan already kind of hit it up. This was the team uh, that we all depended on, and he kind of hit on that. Um, uh, rumor control, operational control, uh, how does the mayor address the people, how does the, the sheriff deal with his deputies, how do we handle things, it was this this group here. So it really is kind of a little a, a mini reunion for me to be on the, uh, the table here with these gentlemen because they, uh, they have public servant uh, in their DNA because they've been doing this, taking care of the people. Uh, they certainly had my back and I had theirs. And uh, we work together and it's good that we can continue this relationship because this is what's going to get things done. Um, for those that aren't aware, the U.S. Border Patrol's roles and responsibilities are between the ports of entry. Our job was to interdict anything and anyone that crossed between the lawful ports of entry. Interdict and apprehend. And I say those separately because sometimes uh, you don't always apprehend when you're trying to interdict, as the, as the sheriff mentioned, gotaways. We would process people, and then we were supposed to turn them over to somebody else. So if we were taking a criminal case... In that situation, we'd go through prosecutorial uh, uh, procedures, U.S. attorneys, Bureau of Prisons, U.S. Marshals, or locally with the sheriff here. Um, or we would do an administrative, which meant we could either remove them to Mexico, 
or turn them over to ICE, Immigrations and Customs Enforcement, for the, the continuation of their immigration proceeding because we were going administratively. Um, we are not immigration officers. We have immigration authority. We're not asylum officers. We ask questions. If someone claims fear, we make a, a, a note and they go through that process and can get a, an asylum interview. People we encounter have crossed the border illegally and have broken the law, 8 uh, USC 1325. If they crossed illegally on foot, if they were smuggled, that would be a different charge. But again, every one that the sheriff mentioned was violating United States law, regardless of what they claim their intent was or what they claimed throughout the process. You know, you hear the term asylum seekers and, and uh, we can, there's a whole different section of the law that addresses that. But when Border Patrol encounters you, you're broken the law in, in a nutshell. Um, we operate in what we call three operating environments, urban. And in an urban environment, you literally have seconds to minutes before somebody can disappear. In a rural environment, a little bit more open, a little more space, it's kind of minutes to hours. And then when you get into a remote area, especially uh, like here we have in southeast Arizona, southwest Arizona, um, here in Yuma County, you, you could be hours to days. You know, people could literally be taking two or three days to get to a vanishing point. And that's why when we talk about infrastructure and technology and personnel, it's so critical. Um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to address the wall, okay? Uh, building the wall was a political statement. What the operators, myself, that was a requirement to help us gain operation control. It was a wall system. It had infrastructure, the brick and mortar. It had roads and access. It had technology in the form of sensor laydowns, camera systems, and additional personnel. What happened on January 21st during inauguration is that was put on hold by, by the president. Already bought and paid for under contract, and it sat here, and you'll see some remnants out there on the tour of where some of that steel is still sitting out there. Spools and spools, miles and miles of cable. Um, we had a plan. We have been working on infrastructure and technology since uh, the Secure Border Initiative after 9-11 in the formation of DHS under President George Bush. Every administration, Bush, Obama, Trump, had leaned forward and was aggressive in securing the border. We had a plan, the transition teams had a plan, said if you stop this, this is gonna be a problem. And uh, <clears throat> just so you know, in October of 2020, Yuma Sector's daily average apprehension was 25 a day. In November, it went up to 34 a day. In December, it was around 55 to 60 a day. In January, it went up to close to 100, and by May it was 500, and by September it was 750 a day. That was um, only to increase in FY22, fiscal year 22. Um, the sheriff mentioned some of the numbers. Fiscal year 20, 68,000 arrests. In, in, excuse me, I'm sorry. In fiscal year 20, 8,800 arrests in Yuma. 8,800 arrests in Yuma, FY20. FY21, fiscal year 21, 114,000 arrests. That was year one under this administration. In fiscal year 22, 310,000 arrests. That's a problem, folks. That's a problem for the second smallest southwest border sector in the country. That's a problem for the county leadership, the sheriff, because you had numbers and numbers of people coming across. Uh, we had on record, on the books, just over 900 border trains assigned to Yuma sector. That included me. I wasn't out there patrolling the border every day. Leon was doing that for me. <laughs> yeah. um, but we were catching more people every day than I had assigned to the sector. It was ridiculous. Um, just in the last, I hope you all follow the, the chiefs and the national chief uh, social media because you get a lot of good information. They, they do a lot of fun stuff to just because they're limited in what they can do. But when they do put out numbers, it's pretty important. The last 96 hours, the U.S. Border Patrol uh, nationwide, over 13,500 arrests with over 4,400 gotaways. And that's just in 96 hours over the long Memorial Weekend. Uh, Yuma, in the last uh, seven days, averaged over 250 arrests, so about 1,800 arrests with, uh, from 58 different countries. So you all just heard from some of the administrators in, in the school district about you know, educating in, in different dialects and stuff. 
and, and predominantly here is uh, Castilian and, and Mexican spoken Spanish. But what about the rest of these countries and where these uh, uh, these diasporas that are showing up in different areas? It's, it's going to be a problem. Um, I'm going to pull no punches here. The first uh, 100 days of the Biden administration, um, he ordered no deportations for the first 100 days. So there's if there's no consequence for your action, that's a problem. Again, focusing on those that have entered illegally. Um, therefore, it basically eliminated ICE's ability to detain people, and that increased the number of people that were coming in here. Um, there, there was also little pressure put back on Mexico. Uh, some of the greatest accomplishments we had uh, during the last, uh, uh, from probably 19 and 2020, was the cooperation from Mexico. They put over 50,000 National Guard troops on their southern and northern border to help stem the flow of these folks that were coming through here, this irregular uh, mass migration that was happening. And that, you know, that combined with policy for the United States and true cooperative agreements from other source countries really shut down this border to create some, some order uh, to what was happening. It was out of control. And I, and I know that there are, there, are, uh, there are policies and things that uh, needed some work, but I would tell you, that uh, the policies under the previous administration were effective. Clunky as all get out as far as executing and getting it done because there's a lot of start and stop and, you know, put it out there, let's get, let's act on this, but we had to hold, I mean, there's a lot of that start and stop, but it shut things down because the messaging was you cannot come over here illegally and think you're going to get the benefits. You're going to have to go through a, a, a proper process. Um, I, uh, I don't know if I just mentioned this, but yesterday here in Yuma, we have uh, some, some checkpoint operations, and I won't get into any op security stuff or tactical stuff, but uh, uh, close to 200 pounds of fentanyl was seized yesterday. The largest uh, single seizure in Yuma's history. Uh, that's a lot of fentanyl, considering what uh, one little can do in the wrong hands, right? Um, I want to add to what's happening in the fentanyl crisis that's impacted every one of us is while your Twitter, your social media, I don't think many of the adults do Snapchat, maybe you do, but uh, that is a huge recruiting tool. Um, here in the state of Arizona, we're pretty much one of the smuggling capitals of the world when it comes down to um, you know, getting uh, uh, things in the wrong hands of our, of our youth. Um, These sm smuggling networks are using Snapchat to recruit people. Come down, make a quick uh, uh, thousand bucks. They would take uh, mom and dad's SUV from Phoenix, Tucson, drive down to the border, pick up a few people and they would pin drop where they're supposed to be. Meanwhile, their instructions were don't stop for law enforcement. Um, I know that uh, Sheriff Wilmot and his uh, good partner out there in Cochise County, uh, Sheriff Daniels can tell you how many, I mean, it's daily, like high speed pursuits where rollovers, fatalities, innocent people, innocent migrants getting killed because these kids don't know any better. They've got that laugh now, pay, uh, cry later attitude and it's being done via social media and Snapchat, as you aware, can can disappear within uh, within 24 hours. So, and then they DM everybody, and that's how they coordinate that. It's it's even worse because oftentimes they're borrowing mom and dad's SUV, and they didn't realize, especially in the state of Arizona, dad may have left his gun in the glove box. So now you've got an armed situation with a high speed pursuit that that can you know really be a, an awful situation. Um, I'll also just say that it's not just the smuggling piece that's getting people killed. Um, there is, I know, a national lawsuit against uh, some of these social media platforms where, um, where kids have ordered what they thought was like a, just an anti-inflammatory uh, Percocet or something like that, which they shouldn't be ordering online anyway, but uh, it's got fentanyl because it's counterfeit, and they're dying, and there's, uh, um, this is a problem. And, and so when I talk about some of the things when we lost policy, when we lost the ability to <clears throat> Uh, finish the wall and the technology uh, most importantly associated with it, we created a vulnerability on the border. We allowed the cartels to control what was happening. In a perfect world, as the chief, I would love to have 80% of my border patrol agents patrolling the border at any given time with the 20% remaining doing some processing and administrative duties that were just part of the job, right? Unfortunately, it was the opposite. I end up having 80% of my deployable workforce processing and caring for migrants that had crossed illegally and 20% patrolling. But by the end of any given eight hour shift, it'd be down to sometimes 10% or no one on the border. 
and it would it would be the sheriff that was had our back. His deputies were able to at least hold people back or alert us. Um, that's a problem. One of the statements that I've made that I've heard a long time ago, and I, I continue to uh, speak about it, is when it, we need to be focusing on border security. Uh, I'm not here as an immigration expert. I'm not going to get into immigration policy. My job was border security. We can have another conversation another time with different people to talk about immigration. But we need to be, when it comes down to border security, we need to be looking at this as we have a right and an obligation to protect our homeland. We should be a country of tall fences and wide gates. Amen. The tall fence should, is our border security method, right? To keep that up. The wide gates, thank you. The wide gates are to allow a controlled, sustained, maintained, secure flow for lawful trade and travel and migrants that are seeking some kind of relief here. It's the right way to do business. It's the way we do it everywhere else in our world. I like to go to concerts. I don't get to go run the front line to get the best seat. I have to wait in line. Um, when you look at this from a security perspective, most people's homes, and I'll even broaden out that some people probably like the mayor lives in a gated community, so he's got a gate. Do not. <laughs> 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 like yeah. So, so you, you have a, a, a gated community, so there's security there. You have a lock on your front door. You have a lock on your bedroom door. And if you have a bathroom in your master bedroom, you've got a lock on that door. But we have people that are against putting a lock on our front door so we can just find out who is coming in and who and, 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 and control that. We need to be investing in those wide gates as much as we are investing in the tall fences. And again, just a, a, to me, it's just something that resonates with me and I'm able to talk about it. And I really like that. Um, I, uh, I will wrap up here and just say that the solutions to our problems right now are going to be complex because we're dealing with, we're people dealing with people. There are people around this world that need our help. Not everybody, but there are people that need our help. And there, and there is a process for that. There's application process. There's things we can do. And then those that are in dire straits, you know, we, we want to help them. But not everybody can be in dire straits. We've got to clean up our own backyard and charity starts at home. And we need to be able to focus on that and, and then, then help everybody else. But we heard from educators today. You heard from, and you'll hear more from uh, local leadership about the impacts of the community. People don't think about that when it's not in their backyard. It is now. Yeah, it is now. Yeah, it's coming to you. But the lines in the hospitals. We learned about the, the Spanish speakers here in Yuma, but you know, last year or the year, yeah, last year, we led the nation in Chinese apprehensions and Russian apprehensions here for a while. I'm talking in the thousands. They probably don't speak English as a, as a first. So they show up in a community that doesn't have that, that group, it's going to be an impact. Or the EMTs that respond. You know? So there, there is a, a second, third order fact when you do not control the migration piece. And I won't get too much into that because I, I promised I wouldn't talk about that. But the most of the, the concerns are not a brute force issue. And I, and I used to speak to Governor Ducey about that as well as the gentleman at the table about it's a policy issue. It was, we, we, we had historic lows in the illegal immigration uh, we had some of the highest levels of border security, and then because of policies, the pull factors created. Not a single one of the migrants that I would talk to, and I didn't talk to all of them, believe me, uh, never heard that climate change was the reason why they were leaving their country. Right? They came here for different reasons, right? They knew that there was economic opportunities. They had some family that had been here and said, hey, come on. They were tired of the communities they were living in. But it was policies, right? Because those that wanted to come over here and claim fear of return or end up seeking asylum passed through multiple countries that they could have sought asylum in. So again, we got rid of that third country cooperative agreement. It's back on the table now, which is good. Um, but um, at the end of the day, you know, and, and as Leon mentioned, uh, as Sheriff Wilmot mentioned, every one of us on this table could spend eight hours and not even get to the points that we stood continue to talk about because there's so much involved here. But what it's gonna do, it's gonna take more of this. It's going to take a groups like you all with local leaders from the ground up to bring the concerns to say, hey, if we've got a migration flow here, and we've got people here, how do we benefit from them and they can and we can help them, those that have the right to stay here? Because, again, they don't all have a right to stay here. But if they do, let's help them out. Let's help ourselves out. Let's get them to work. Let's get them, uh, get them educated and assimilated so they can help uh, the American dream for all of us. Um, it won't happen easily because, again, You've got so many polarizing topics. Everybody's got a story, um, but it's going to take consistent 
forward leaning from folks like you all, from these gentlemen. It's going to take Congress to come down here and do those border hearings. I'm a big proponent of the border hearings because uh, the hearings because every one of them got to testify. Some sides will say it was a political stunt. No, the stunt is not coming down here and talking <coughs> to the people impacted. The stunt is not listening to you all when you go back to your homes and you talk to your folks and say, I was there. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, it's going to take this momentum. It's going to take everybody to, like I like to say, we're going to have to roll up our sleeves and get dirty, but we're going to get there because we all know what's right and what's wrong. And uh, again, I, I do appreciate y'all's time here. I am going to be with y'all uh, for the rest of the tour. So, you know, I won't be here for the afternoon, evening session with your policymakers, but uh, for the rest of the day, uh, if you see me, you got follow-up questions, please uh, I'll do the best I can to, to answer it. But uh, uh, your point of contact, know how to get a hold of me for follow-ups. And then um, I'm gonna turn it back over to, uh, to Mr. Lyons here. So thank y'all. Thank you, Chief. There's always a competition to see who is the most loquacious <laughs> between those two, so they can go on all day. <laughs> uh, my great friend uh, and my fellow criminal, you can ask us about that later, because uh, we're not criminals, but <clears throat> that's our high school, uh, Mayor Doug Nichols. Thanks, Jonathan. Well, welcome to Yuma. I don't know if anyone said that to you yet. Um, we're a whole lot more than just a border crisis, and I like to point that out. Hopefully you've seen that coming around our community. I don't know what your uh, expectation was walking into this. I'm sure it wasn't what you saw unless you've been here before. Uh, has anyone been here before? Driven through. Okay, well, you, Steve, of course, Steve, right. But, um, so I would like to first talk a little bit about the community you're in so that you understand kind of the background besides just what all the numbers mean, because the numbers are, are kind of, well, they are scary and crazy, but, um, it was mentioned the city itself is about 100, I think we're at 110 now, um, but we're 100 to 10,000 people. This is my ninth year as mayor, so I've been around a little bit of time. Um, and our community is a um, majority minority community. We're 65% Hispanic. And I will tell you, um, within about two generations, everyone can trace their, their lineage back to immigrating into the United States. Um, my father-in-law immigrated at age 18. To me, he's the, the perfect example of the American dream. Legally immigrated at 18, built businesses, sent his daughters to school, owned a home, never took a dime, uh, and has always given back. One of the most generous people I know, uh, and it's an honor uh, to be in his family, but he is as upset about this crisis as much as I am. So this is not a race thing. This is what's right. It's what's the law and making sure is, was been, has been described, who's, we know who's coming through and what their intentions are and what they wanna do. Um, and so what this crisis does to us as a community is actually some very things that are not very tangible. Um, your perspective walking into Yuma probably was fairly negative, uh, but there are some amazing, amazing things happening in this community. There's some amazing people in this community and we're moving forward. This isn't defining us as a community. However, it is on the national stage. So we were trying to attract jobs and grow our economy, grow our workforce uh, into you know, what we need for the next generation or two. That becomes very difficult because you're fighting against this national narrative of this uncontrolled border. It is an uncontrolled border, but it doesn't define our community. Um, and that's, we've had our tourism drop. We've had uh, real struggles with locating businesses here. Um, not because there's a workforce issue, not because there's a development issue or a construction issue or any of that. It has a lot to do with what people see and they cross us off the list because what they hear about Yuma is all this negativity. So that's part of the, the impact um, that this is having on us, but also on our nonprofit. So uh, the hospital was mentioned uh, last fiscal year or last calendar year. Uh, they, uh, well, first of all, we have one hospital here. Okay, it's a, it's a large hospital, privately held um, nonprofit, and, but they serve everybody. They, you don't ask a question, you walk in the door, everyone gets served. Um, the end of last year, by the time they got through serving the 
the 310,000 people that came through, they were $26 million short of being reimbursed by the federal government. $26 million for a community of 200,000 plus people. And as you know business, that money gets assigned somewhere. And so if they cannot ever get reimbursed, that 26 million gets filtered into when I take my kid in for a broken arm or I go in for, for whatever. <clears throat> It, it works against us as a community, and it's completely, um, well, it's completely solvable, but we'll get to there. Um, Amberly's Place is our victim's rights, uh, I always forget the description. Family women and children. Family advocacy is, is the correct. So uh, when men and women and children come across the border and they claim they've been raped and abused, they're taken to Amberly's Place so that they can be, it can be documented. The problem we have is those are international crimes. So there's no one for them to hand the paperwork to. There's no law enforcement element that can then trans, can go into Mexico. Because a lot of times they don't even know which country the abuse happened in. So this is not a humanitarian process. I, I know some people like to talk about this as we're just letting the people in to the country because it's the humanitarian thing to do. But what we've done as a nation is set up a and supported a process that supports the abuse, the uh, extortion of people that are trying to come into this country. And because the federal government won't stand up against that and try to stop that flow, it is facilitating it. I'll tell you, if that happened in any other country, on any other continent, and anywhere else in the world, we'd be the first country to stand up and say that has to stop. Except for when it's ours, for whatever reason. And you can, I'm sure we can spend all day talking about those reasons. But um, that's, that's really kind of the, the really frustrating thing. So history um, really helps us keep things in perspective. So if you look at uh, immigration, illegal immigration over the last, say, 20 years, the laws haven't changed. What's changed in the, is the policies. And you can see this. Under President Bush, we had a dramatic increase. We had 148,000 people coming across the border. Those people who are coming across the border were, were difficult to interdict. They were not the give ups like we're having today. And so there was a lot of police chases, uh, the sheriff's department, the police department backed up border patrol because these things were happening. People were literally driving through the desert because there was no barrier along the, wall, uh, along the border. So they would literally drive through the desert and that would start a high speed chase. So President Bush sent down the National Guard, they built what we call the landing mat fence, which I think is all gone by now, but uh, was a barrier system. And those National Guardsmen and women were, were pelted with rocks, occasional gunfire while they were putting that up. But it dropped the numbers to the next year to less than 10,000. Barriers work, they're a tool, they're not the solution. Um, same laws on the book, different policies. 2019 under President Trump, we had another surge through the Yuma area 5,700 people were released from the local border patrol station. This is before Chief Clem was, was in the area. Um, 5,700 people in three months. At that time, I met with President Trump and we had a different set of policies, same laws, and within those three months, those numbers dropped to zero. Uh, so since, as it was described by Chief, uh, since the beginning of this administration, the policies are dramatically different, the laws are still the same. So the point of the matter is that it isn't, congressional intervention is necessary. That needs to happen at some point, but there's, the laws on the books are sufficient in order to put the correct policies in place to control the situation. All my discussions with the White House, all my discussions with the Secretary's office, focus on facilitating the flow. They wanna get through the process quicker. Under the previous administrations I talked about, their, po their policies are based upon stopping the flow. And that is the dramatic difference. Um, so from that perspective, I'm not convinced Congress needs to start now. I mean, they do need to start now, but it's gonna be years to get through an immigration uh, overhaul in our country. Doesn't need to happen, it does need to happen. But that's just an excuse to not address the policies as they sit today. Um, boy, I could go on for quite a while, but I know we're running a little bit long on time. So 
I'll turn it over to to Jonathan, and then we can take questions. So some of the additional challenges that we faced here in Yuma County are dealing with really uh, the effects of illegal immigration. I'm the chairman, or the vice chairman of uh, Amberley's Place. Our youngest victim came in 12, had been raped multiple times. We did not have a country of origin to prosecute, so we had a jurisdictional challenge, as the mayor mentioned. I'm also the chairman of the food bank, and I have worked with uh, <clears throat> several different uh, comp or not companies, but several different uh, churches to bring over 550,000 pounds of food into the human community to disperse through the food bank to the different NGOs to make sure that when people are showing up, they can be taken care of. Uh, one of the jokes that we always <clears throat> told with Chief Clem is that regardless of where you come from or how you got here, you're going to have a five-star experience in Yuma. Um, and to be as humanitarian as we possibly can, regardless of the circumstances that people find themselves in. Unfortunately, a lot of these people are being trafficked. Um, we know that kind of the base rate pay for each individual starts, you know, depending upon the country of origin, $6,000 up to $50,000. Um, and oftentimes, these people don't have the ability to make cash payments. So they become indebted to the cartels. Just before COVID hit, AP put out a story talking about the LA Basin in that they estimated up to 75% of all manual labor in the LA Basin was undocumented. So people coming to this country and claiming that it's humanitarian, let them come in, they're really at the hands of the disposition of the cartels. And they never actually are able to get out of the shadows and come into, uh, a real existence, uh, being members of our society. The other challenge that we have is assimilation. Um, and that's forever going to be a challenge. In, and one of the uh, things that's not widely reported, when you go 25 miles to our uh, southwest border, uh, we've had over 300 murders and assassinations since this began. And it doesn't stop. This continues. You've got the new generation cartel, which are El Chapo's sons, fighting against mid-level management on the other side of the border in Sinaloa, uh, vying for control of all of this traffic, the human traffic and the trafficking of narcotics. Uh, we don't necessarily have as much violence in Baja California. They seem to be stable. But over here, uh, it is ridiculous. And if you go on and dig a little bit, you'll see on a daily basis, the kidnappings and the extortion. Uh, the son, Mara, I don't know if you were the one that covered the story a couple weeks ago about the uh, group that was being held hostage. Um, in San Luis, Rio, Colorado, there were 130 migrants and where they were being held, they called to their family. And this is not a new story. It's part of the ongoing narrative. All of these people were contacted or their families were contacted and they demanded an additional $2,500 on top of what they had already paid. Otherwise, something was going to happen. And uh, the state and federal authorities in uh, San Luis put out a presser and said, hey, look what we did to stop trafficking. Well, that's 130 of the few hundred thousand that have come through Yuma over the last couple of years. We are the nation's uh, leading producer of your leafy green vegetables. So from October to April, we <coughs> produce 95% of all of the leafy greens that are consumed in North America, both for the United States and for Canada, represents just under a $4 billion industry. The majority of the pasta that you eat the rest of the year, varilla or whatever, guess what? It's grown in Yuma, Arizona, turned into pasta somewhere else and then comes back and then you guys get to enjoy it. So food security is uh, a national security issue. We don't necessarily talk about some of the challenges, but <clears throat> there along the border, all of the ag producers have had to adapt and put into practice additional safety measures, which are self-policing, uh, undetected entry or unauthorized entry into a field. Then they have to bring out uh, the ag inspectors and they've got to determine whether or not uh, they can continue with that crop, whether it should be plowed under or whether it should go to seed. Uh, so that's always been a, an ongoing challenge. Um, there's a lot that we can talk about. You've got uh, a good kind of broad coverage of some of the challenges that we face here in Yuma. My family's been in Arizona for, oh, she's going back to 1880s. Um, 
I've been in Yuma since the 20s. Uh, we love our community. We're not going anywhere. S interesting side note, uh, the mayor mentioned the demographic, 65% Hispanic. Well, um, interestingly enough, and if you're talking politics real quickly, as in my former life, I was the chairman of the uh, Arizona Republican Party. Uh, and so I always looked at those numbers. But um, now for the first time, and I believe it's because of this issue specifically, uh, where you had about a 60-40 split, uh, or I'm sorry, about a 55-45 split, the Republicans are now leading in registration for Yuma County. Uh, the, the current uh, chairman uh, gave me those notes a couple of weeks ago, and it, I believe it's because of these issues. The mayor mentioned his father-in-law. Uh, the guy who cuts my, uh, my grass said he drove around with a Trump sticker on. He said, Jonathan, I'm sick and tired of this crap. Uh, <clears throat> I apologize for saying that, but he was a little bit more graphic in his description. He says, I waited this many years, and I paid this much money to do this legally. Um, so people are, are frustrated. I will close on one note, the fentanyl aspect of it. Um, it's very personal to a lot of us. The national average is one in 100,000. Here in Yuma, as the mayor and the sheriff mentioned, we had 15 poisonings last year. That's significantly greater. So are we being impacted? My <coughs> wife's assistant left my home. Two hours later, she got a phone call. Please come to the hospital. Her 18-year-old son, first time. Somebody slipped him something. It was laced with fentanyl, and we watched him die two days later. There, the stories like that are countless in our lives as far as the impact that it has had on our community. I've had visitors, you know, uh, congressional delegations from all over the country, uh, senators, governors, and they've all told me the exact same thing. It's not a border problem anymore. It's not a Yuma problem. This is in our neighborhoods, and we need to do something about it. So thank you very much for being here. We can take some questions now. Thank <laughs> you.